All right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the talk of Toby Pasciora. Um, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay, my re and pay our respects to their elders past and present, and elders from other communities that may be here today. So today's speaker is Toby Pasciora from University of Tokyo. Um, I first met Toby and Jason and I first, actually Jason introduced us to Toby and I when he saw a talk of Toby's at Lawn last year and uh, he said, this is exactly what we need to do. <laughs> this is the stuff that we need to do for our back inhibitors, which we got published earlier this year. Um, because Toby's work uses non-canonical amino acids and screening libraries of, non, of peptides with non-canonical amino acids to look at, to find new binding partners or novel binding partners. Um, we both thought it was a cool talk then and we're still hoping that one day we can start some collaboration on the matter. We've, we've been trying to move towards the CDA on that over the last few years. But in the meantime, Toby has, um, uh, Toby and I have been back and forth in contact a few times and he said he was coming to Melbourne. So I said, well, you should come and speak at WeHi. And then some more interest has come along from his talk. So, um, he's now got a couple of reasons to be here. Um, Toby did his uh, PhD at UNSW. He is a, um, uh, he then worked for, for uh, Johnson & Johnson for a couple of years before uh, taking a year off and traveling around South America and uh, coming back to Australia and finding um, a position eventually at University of Tokyo where he's an assistant professor there um, and working on these interesting library screening methods. Thank you, Toby. Thanks, Peter, and thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, so, so this this is the sort of molecule that I'm interested in. This is uh, it's a peptide, but it's a cyclic peptide, and it's a relatively small cyclic peptide. Um, and we're interested in finding molecules of this sort that bind to really any target that you can think of, um, with a view to developing a sort of new therapeutic class. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'll talk about the, fairly briefly about the technology that we use to do that, and then I'll walk you through a few examples that we've got, and again, that'll be fairly brief, it'll be three or four slides on each one, and then sort of towards the end of the talk, uh, in the time left, I want to go through a sort of variation on that technique that we've developed in the last year or two, which allows um, fairly thorough and very rapid structure activity studies of both protein peptide interactions and interactions with these sorts of molecules that we're interested in. So, so I'll sort of start with, oh, this has become a little bit scrambled. Let's, we'll see how we go here. Um, sort of start talking about the, the druggable proteome. That is, what is the set of proteins that are targetable using different classes of drugs? So if you look at the ones that have binding pockets for small molecules, it's about 15% of all human proteins. Um, and when I'm talking about small molecules here, I'm talking about really sort of traditional small molecules, 500 Daltons or less, this sort of, this sort of space, right? Um, and the other 85% are just not really targetable using these sorts of compounds. Of these, though, 33% of the total are extracellular, and you could conceivably target these with antibodies. Um, but that still leaves 52% of all possible targets that really aren't accessible to you. They're in the cell um, and they mainly interact with other macromolecules. So we're sort of talking about protein-protein interactions here and protein-protein interaction inhibitors. So what we're trying to do is to find molecules that are cell membrane permeable and able to um, block these protein-protein interactions. <laughs> And if you think about the potential here, it's actually pretty enormous, right? I mean, it's, imagine if you could have antibodies that could get into cells. This would be incredible, right? Um, we're not quite there, um, but we're getting pretty close, I think. So, so what do we know about compounds that can do this? One of the key points here is size, right? So if you look at the molecular weight of known therapeutics, going down from very, very small to very large, you have small molecules at one end and antibodies at the other, and some things in the middle, notably quite a few peptides. Um, and towards the smaller end of the scale is where you get compounds that are orally available, able to passively diffuse across membranes and so on. And towards the larger end of the scale is where you get compounds that are able to block protein-protein interactions. 
And the reason for this is pretty self-evident, right? These ones are large enough to be able to bind to the relatively flat surfaces of protein-protein interactions, and these ones are small enough that they're able to get through membranes. But it turns out that there's a space just in the middle where you can get compounds that have both properties. And what you're talking about here is sort of large-ish small molecules or um, maybe smallish peptides, which is sort of what we're working on, right? And it's, I don't think anyone's completely clear um, what the boundaries of this space are, but you're sort of looking at about 700 to 1,200 Daltons, probably. So what do we know about the compounds that are in here? Um, some of these are, are large. Oh. Some of them are um, peptides. And quite a lot. This is British. Oh, yeah, we've got it. We've got it. Thank you so much, Chris. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Many of them are co and Yeah. And they are produced by organisms that make them as a sort of arms race, the organisms they're competing with. They tend to be antibiotic or toxic. And they're very strongly bioactive. They can be drug-like in the sort of sense of being able to passively diffuse across membranes, fairly hydrophobic. They can block protein-protein interactions. Um, and, and there's a couple of examples. This is cyclosporin, which is an immunosuppressant. This one, alpha-amanitin, is the major toxin in death cap mushrooms. So this will kill you very, very rapidly if you eat that. Um, and compared to normal, chemist uh, normal peptides, they usually have a lot of these sort of non-canonical chemistries, right? In the first place, they're cyclic. Right? That's kind of obvious. But these white highlighted sections are chemistries that you don't see in normal proteins, right? And they're critical for both the activity but also the bioavailability of these sorts of compounds. So what we're doing is we're trying to find a general platform that will enable us to identify molecules of this kind to any protein that we are interested in. Right? And there are basically two platform technologies associated with this. Um, the first, they have these catchy acronyms. The first one is called uh, FIT, and this is a genetic code reprogramming technique. And it allows us to put into peptides that are translated through ribosomes, almost not any chemistry you can think of, but very diverse chemistry. So we can put literally hundreds of different amino acids into peptides, you can use polyester, make polyesters, N-methylated, D-stereochemistry, unusual side chains, all sorts of things. And the second, this uh, so-called RAPID, is a screening technology that enables you to rapidly isolate from libraries that you generate through FIT any compound that binds to a target of interest. Um, the acronym itself is gibberish. Even the uh, the guy who invented the acronym, I saw him give a speech recently, and he described it as random blah, 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 which I think is about right. So just very quickly, um, and I'm not going to go into the detail of this. Anyone who wants to know about it can ask me, how do we do the genetic code reprogramming? And the simple answer is that we make amino acids, uh, we put amino acids onto tRNAs, so we synthesize these. We do this using a... Um, a ribozyme, so an RNA enzyme that amino isolates tRNAs. And then you put these into a fully reconstituted translation reaction. It's not a cell lysate, and it's important that it's not a cell lysate. But every component of bacterial translation is purified separately and then recombined to make this reaction. And this requires, obviously, ribosomes, quite a few recombinant proteins. It changes a little bit depending on how you set it up. Um, Amino acids, note there's only 17, I'll come back to that in a second. The tRNAs for all of the canonical amino acids, so not these ones, but the normal tRNAs, and a whole bunch of small molecules. The reason that there are only 17 here rather than the full 20 is that you can't put something in unless you take something out. Right? You have to free up space in the genetic code for the non-canonical amino acids. And this is, uh, produces a certain number of limitations. We're getting around them in some ways now, but it is a fundamental limitation. This one here, um, I just want to point out, is a chloracetylated amino acid. Um, and we use these very frequently as a way of making macrocyclic peptides. I'll show you how that's done in a second. It's useful with this sort of stuff to think about codon tables. Um, probably a lot of you haven't thought about codon tables since undergraduate biochemistry. 
Um, but it is useful to think about them in terms of the genetic codes that are produced for different situations. And I'll show you a few of these. So here's just a, a standard um, bacterial codon table. First position on over there, second position at the top, third position there, and uh, each one specifies a codon with the, the uh, relevant amino acid, right? Um, in fact, we typically use libraries that only have 32 codons. So you only need to think about two nucleotides in the third position, right? Um, it's not really a big deal, but the, the codon tables I show you will usually only have two there. And for sort of technical reasons that I'm not going to get into, the, trans, the initiation of translation is a completely different event to the elongation of translation. And that means that you can think of there being two codon tables. One is for the initiating amino acid and only has a single amino acid in it. And the, others, the other is for everything else. Right? So if you set up one of these reactions where you don't put in all of the amino acids, then that frees up space. You, you can free up the initiating methionine residue and other um, amino acid codons here. And then you can put in whatever you like, right? So this is a, um, a fairly representative example of the sort of thing we do. An n chlorosetylated tyrosine at the, um, at the first position. Um, and I think all of the peptides I'll show you today have this, or almost all of them have this uh, n chlorosetylated uh, initiator. And then sort of whatever you want in the middle. We tend to put in a lot of um, N-methyl amino acids because we think these are likely to help with membrane permeability. So that's the basis of the genetic code reprogramming. That's a very brief overview. And like I said, I'm happy to talk about details if anyone wants to ask. How do you go from there to making a library of compounds? Um, and it's pretty simple. So you, you start with a, a stretch of DNA. Uh, which is semi-randomised, so it has a randomised bit in the middle and known sections at the end. And this is a very short piece of DNA. You could just assemble it by uh, primer extension in a, uh, a simple PCR reaction. And this is about 10 to the 14 molecules. Right? It's very easy to get high degrees of diversity with randomised stretches of nucleotides. You transcribe this into an RNA, you translate this into a peptide, um, and the N-terminal chlorocetyl group will react spontaneously with the downstream cysteine, which is encoded here, right? And you get a macrocyclic peptide. This cyclization chemistry is, um, is very neat. You can use other cyclization chemistries. It's not the only one that is effective. But this one just happens to have a very nice balance of reactivity. The chlorocetyl group reacts intramolecular, but it doesn't really react intermolecular. When we do this, we don't really know how many molecules we're getting at the end. There's no way of counting them. But we're pretty confident in saying it's more than 10 to the 12. Right? Um, for comparison, typical small molecule libraries that are used for high throughput screening, uh, even, even at, uh, the really large commercial ones, are you know, a million compounds or something. So we're exponentially larger in this space. It is a very, very diverse chemical library. So how do we get from the, this pooled library, where they're all in a single tube together, how do we get out the compounds that we're interested in? And we use a variation of mRNA display. It's a lot like phage display or other display techniques that you're probably familiar with. So you start with the DNA, like I showed you. You transcribe it into an RNA. And then there's a difference here, which is that we uh, then ligate onto the end a molecule of puromycin, which is a ribosomal inhibitory antibiotic, on a sort of flexible linker. Right? Then you translate this in one of your uh, specially reprogrammed reactions. The ribosome comes in. It produces the peptide. You've got a chlorosetylated initiator, a downstream cysteine. And the ribosome gets to this position, and it stalls. And it stalls there because we've set the reaction up to make it stall at that position. And now it is in proximity to the puromycin. Puromycin is an analog of the next amino isolated tRNA in the peptide chain. So, here is the structure of the, the final tRNA linked to the nascent peptide here. And here is the structure of puromycin. And you can see that this is an analog of this. But there is a key difference, which is that this is an amide and this is an ester. So you get peptidyl transfer, 
the peptide is transferred across onto the puromycin here. But this link is now not hydrolyzable, okay? So you now have a fully covalent link the whole way through here, down through this linker and onto the mRNA. And the key point about this is that this peptide is encoded by this RNA. There is no crossover here, right? This cyclizes, and as I showed you before, and now you have a library of 10 to the 12 molecules or so, where each peptide is linked to its cognate RNA. You can pan this for affinity against any target that you're interested in. The requirement really is you just have to be able to express it. Um, and you find what sticks, you wash away anything that doesn't stick, and you can recover this by RT-PCR because you have the mRNA there. If it was just a peptide, you would have no way of recovering a single molecule like that. You now have an enriched library, and you can do the whole thing again. So the typical rates of enrichment are about 10 to 1,000 fold per round. The library is about 10 to the 12 compounds, so it takes about five rounds usually for you to enrich the library to the point that it's just molecules that bind with very high affinity to the target you're interested in. It can be done quite rapidly. A round of selection takes about a day, um, so you can do the whole thing in a week. The peptides you get are very high affinity. They're high selectivity. You can make them by chemical synthesis, and you can get agonists or antagonists from this. So I'll just take you through a few examples of this. Um, the, in this first example, I'm not actually going to show you the sequences. They're a little bit secret. Um, but I'll give you some idea of what they are just to show you how things are going. Um, nearly all of our projects are collaborative projects. We work with people who are experts in a particular protein or disease, um, and we find ligands to uh, their protein of interest. This particular project is a collaboration with Glenn King at IMB at UQ. Um, and the target was this ion channel. It is an acid-sensing ion channel. Um, and it is, uh, to, if blockade of this channel is protective in ischemic conditions. And so it, uh, if you block the channel during stroke models in mice, you get really remarkable recoveries of the, of the mice after the stroke event. And we know this because there is a spider venom that you can use to block the channel. Okay? Unfortunately, it's a very large molecule. The experiments involve uh, direct injection into the brains of mice. So this is not really a very viable uh, therapeutic strategy. And Glenn was interested in getting a, uh, something rather smaller. I don't think the compounds we have will go across the blood-brain barrier either, but it uh, serves as a useful example in this case. This is the sequence of the spider venom. It's a constrained peptide, and it has this four basic residue motif that pokes into the acid sensing pocket of the channel. And as you'll see, the peptides that we have derived do so too. Um, and we started this work on the chicken protein because the human was not available at the time. Um, I'll show you some stuff with the human one later. Um, isn't the internet amazing, right? So here are, here are uh, eight of the peptides we pulled out of the selection against the um, the channel the first time through. Um, you can see, I've shown you where the basic residues are here, so you can see that there is the, um, the sort of, we are rediscovering that motif from the, the venom, right? And here are the KD values. These are particularly strong. Uh, we don't always get things as good as this, um, but this is not the only case of them being, being strong either. Some of these are so strong we can't really measure them. Um, we, we probably could if we really tried to, but they are, they're off the bottom of what we can uh, get good data for by SPR. We did subsequently get the human channel, um, and in this case, there is pretty good cross-reactivity to the human channel. We don't always see that. Uh, this one is selective for the chicken over the human, and these IC50 values are, um, uh, are um, patch clamp experiments. Um, so beautifully active, right? Picomolar activity on some of these, they're great. Um, and just to um, quickly show you that there are differences in the pharmacology of these as well, so they don't all act in exactly the same mechanism. Some of them are partial antagonists, some of them are fully reversible, some of them are partially reversible. So you get quite a few molecules out of these screens, right? And they behave in different ways. Um, because this worked so nicely, we, we went back and tried it with a more elaborate library. So the first one I showed you was just that chloracetal initiator so that it's cyclized. This one is N-methylated, and so we chose a bunch of amino acids that didn't really come up in the first selection and replaced them with N-methyl ones. Um, and this time we had the human channel. 
And, and once again, thanks to the internet, I have a picture of a human for you. Um, I gave almost exactly the same talk yesterday at uh, MIPS, and I used a picture of Ray Norton, and I think I got a bigger laugh for that one. I think, think people like it when you mock Ray. Um, so these are the peptides we got off the, the human one. This one didn't work quite as well. Um, the, the, the biggest variable in these experiments is the quality of the protein, because everything else is exactly the same, right? So my guess is just that the particular prep was not quite as good. Um, there were a few that, uh, they seem to have these um, fairly basic motifs, but they're just not giving good binding. Um, we do, do see some false positives. It's not usually as high as this. Okay. So that's where I will leave it for the ASIC 1A stuff. Um, that's, with these projects, that tends to be about where we stop the majority of our work. We hand the molecules over to the collaborator, and they do a whole bunch of biology. And then we might go back and um, revisit those again once they have worked out which is the best one or two compounds. Right? We can't work with too many at once. Um, this, this next one is a, a hepatitis B virus entry inhibitor. This is a collaboration with um, the National Institute for Infectious Diseases in Tokyo. Um, and the target in this case is another membrane protein. It's this um, NTCP protein, which is a toracolate transporter. And it is also the receptor for HBV, um, which uh, recognizes it through one of the surface antigens of the virion. This is the library that we used. Um, I'm not going to show you all of the peptides that we got in this case. These are just the three best ones. Um, they're reasonably active. They're, not, they're certainly nowhere near as active as the, um, the ASIC-1A ones that I just showed you, but the, the best one has an IC50 that seems to be at least in the nanomolar range. What's neat about these is that they don't affect the function of the transporter in any way. So there are other entry inhibitors that are known, which also bind to this protein but they inhibit the function of the transporter. So we've, we've been able to show that you can pharmacologically separate those two things out. Again, very high KD values. The KD values are higher than the, the uh, IC50 values. So that's fairly typical. Um, and just to prove that this is genuinely a uh, blockage of a protein-protein interaction, you can take the viral antigen and label it with a fluorophore and then stain cells and block that interaction with the peptide. Um, so you see with high peptide concentrations, you get no staining of the cells, but as you start to drop it, then the staining increases. This next one is a project we've been working on for a long time. We've published at least two, we've published two papers on this, um, and there is a third one that has a bit more to do with it. It's um, it's one of our longer running projects, and we've tended to, because we know this protein so well, we've tended to use it for experiments where we're setting up new uh, techniques a bit. So we've done a lot of work on this. Uh, this is a lysine demethylase, um, and it's, it's a collaboration with uh, Chris Schofield and Akane Kawamura at Oxford. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is the first intracellular protein I'm showing you now, right? So the first, up until now, we've been extracellular. This is the, the lysine demethylase itself. It catalyzes this reaction on histone lysines and regulates gene expression. Uh, and this is the structure bound to the natural substrate, right? So here is the trimethyl lysine poking down into the active site of the enzyme. Um, the selection against this yielded these uh, proteins, uh, these peptides, it, some others as well, but these are the ones that we sort of characterized in a bit more detail, particularly the top one, CP2. Uh, which have this sort of conserved RSG motif. Again, sort of low nanomolar. Um, well, this is an IC50. Um, KDs are also low nanomolar. And this is the crystal structure of it bound to the protein, right? So here is the, the protein with our peptide poking down into the active site. Um, and if you look at the peptide itself, you can see that it's actually a sort of mini beta sheet with a turn with an arginine that pokes down into the active site there. Um, and this is something we sort of see. You, you start to see in these peptides sort of proto-structures, you know, a small stretch of beta sheet, half a twist of helix sometimes. Um, so, you know, I sort of told you at the start that we're interested in trying to find things that will go into cells, right? 
And this is, this is really the big question. How do you get them into cells? Um, how does this one go in cells? It's totally rubbish. So this is the, uh, the one that we discovered. This is the in vitro IC50. And in cells, you can just load it up with huge concentrations, and it does not go across the membrane. Working off the crystal structure, we, we put in a, a number of um, sort of structural changes to try and increase the overall hydrophobicity of the compound in the hope to get it across the membrane. Um, and it works. This prob number is probably a little bit high, actually. It's probably closer to one micromolar. Depends on the assay you use. Um, and that does work a bit. We can get activity in cells. But there's still a pretty big drop off here. Um, in part, that's because just putting in these modifications has dropped the in vitro activity by more than a factor two, because when you select these compounds out of these very diverse libraries, any change you make to it weakens activity, or almost any change. Um, we've started to look at this far more systematically, so I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then even accounting for that, there's still a 10 or 50-fold drop-off going across the cell membrane. So we'd really like to find things that are much better at going across membranes than this. Um, sort of making a leap back to the natural products I was talking about at, about at the start, how close, close are we with this sort of compound to natural products like cyclosporin? The answer is we're not very close at all, right? I mean, you can do um, a, a range of sort of more sophisticated statistical analyses looking at uh, pulled surface area and all of the typical things, hydrogen bond donors and acceptors and all of this, but here is our original CP2, here is CP2.3, and here is cyclosporin. And I think looking at these pictures, it's fairly clear that this compound is both smaller and more hydrophobic than either of these, right? And cyclosporin is probably a bit of an outlier anyway. It's probably unusually large for a membrane permeable compound. So if you're going to start looking for peptides that are significantly more hydrophobic than this, then you can't use the normal amino acids. They're simply too hydrophilic. Most of them are very polar. Many of them are charged. But we have the luxury that we can sort of just take them out, right? Because we can do this genetic code reprogramming. So here's an example of a selection we did against the interleukin-6 receptor. Um, so on the left here is the normal codon table. And in this case, the residues, the, the heat map here indicates hydrophilicity. Right? And this is the reprogrammed one we used. So we took out everything that was strongly polar and hydrophilic and we replaced it with this motley assortment of much more hydrophobic residues. Right? And, and this was a sort of a, a pilot experiment in some ways. We didn't really think we were going to get something out of this that would passively diffuse across membranes straight away. What we were interested in finding out is if, if you take out all of the molecules or virtually all of the residues that are capable of forming polar interactions with a target, can you even get a ligand? It wasn't obvious that we would be able to. Um, and um, the short answer is that we were able to get a ligand. Um, so I don't have a, a crystal structure for this, so I can't show you a, a similar sort of picture. But we're, we're getting kind of this is cyclosporin, and these are two of the peptides we pulled out. We're getting kind of close here, I think. These are still a little bit big and a little bit polar compared to cyclosporin. And ideally, you'd want to be quite a lot smaller than cyclosporin. But we're still getting things that are in that low nanomolar range. So it seems like you don't need to have charged residues or you know, um, asparagine and glutamine, these very strongly polar residues, in order to get ligands with a fair amount of specificity, I think. We, we haven't investigated the specificity in a large amount of detail, but it certainly doesn't bind to BSA. We tested it in a couple of other um, common proteins as well. One of the things I haven't really showed you up until now um, is that one of the other nice things about this technique is that if you sequence the final library with a, high, a next generation sequencer, right, a, a MySec or whatever, then you actually get something like a structure activity relationship for your peptides as well. So we can look at the alignment of all of the peptides that come out of the selection, and you can see exactly which residues are completely conserved and which ones there can be a little bit of variability. In this case, there is this methylglycine that is almost totally conserved in the middle, and the N-methyl, O-methyl tyrosine has to be an aromatic next to that, and so on. So we already know from just identifying these molecules something about what modifications we can make to them and still retain some degree of activity.
Um, so that, that's sort of where we're up to it at the moment with the drug discovery stuff. We, we have other projects ongoing that I haven't uh, really talked about today. Um, here's a, some sort of set of them. Um, these ones in white were the ones I showed you. Um, the, um, the next step is really to try and work on those, those very hydrophobic compounds, try and get something a bit smaller um, and something that really will go into cells. So that's, that's where we're aiming with that next. Um, in parallel to that, we've been working on this sort of new technique for um, assessing protein-peptide interactions and also doing structure activity relationships on the peptides we discover. Um, and I think probably that will uh, become an integral part of our sort of drug discovery type effort. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about for, for the sort of second half of this talk. So. The first example of this that I'm going to show you is a, uh, a cyclotide. This is a, a collaborative project with David Craig at IMB. Um, and this is the, the cyclotide. It's, uh, again, it's another one of these constrained peptides with three disulfides. And it's got this, uh, this area in blue is the, uh, the loop of the cyclotide that is mostly responsible for binding to the, the target protein, which in this case is trypsin. This is a trypsin inhibitor. And if you're looking at an interaction like this, um, there are sort of a, a few classical ways that you can start to investigate the structure activity relationship. Um, obviously, modeling, if you have the structure. If you don't have the structure, that becomes a little bit difficult. You can look at things like alanine scans, right? But that doesn't really provide you very much information. Um, you can look at saturation mutagenesis approaches. So like alanine scans, but with all sorts of different amino acids, right? Um, but that still limits you to the 20 normal amino acids, right? You can't see what happens if you um, change the stereochemistry of one point or if you put a fluorine in in place of a hydrogen or you know, small, small scale uh, sort of fine resolution changes. Um, and that's what we've been looking to address. So the, this work is, um, it, it sort of just got to the point where we're getting quite good at this. Um, this one with uh, this cyclotide was one of the early attempts. I'll, I'll take you through it. Uh, the, the workflow here is, is very much glossed over. There is a lot of technical detail in here that I think doesn't really bear talking about in this sort of presentation. But you can construct a library where instead of having random sequences, you just change one codon going through, right? And you can make this any amino acid. You can make it so this codon is completely random, and you just scan it through the peptide. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, well, I know, Peter, you've seen um, Amy Keating's work doing BCL2 proteins with this. This is a reasonably common uh, sort of approach with um, saturation mutagenesis, right? Um, and because the cyclotide doesn't have three amino acids in its native sequence, we can replace the ones that aren't there with non-canonical amino acids, right? So in this case, it's, they're all alanine analogs. This is D-alanine amino isobutyric acid, which is like uh, a combination of D and L alanine. It's disubstituted and N-methylalanine. And if you take this library and you select it against a target, and instead of just looking at what comes out, you look at what went in and what comes out, and you sequence both samples on a next-gen sequencer, then you can look at the fold change and now you're starting to get a quantitative measure rather than a sort of semi-quantitative one, which is what we were getting out of those previous selections. Um, and doing this sort of thing, you can do saturation mutagenesis experiments, but starting to use non-canonical amino acids and looking at uh, changes that you wouldn't be able to look at otherwise. So here is the example for uh, MCoTI2 binding to trypsin. The native sequence of MCoTI2 is uh, it's going up on the sort of y-axis here. So this is the N-terminal and the C-terminal. This is where the uh, disulfide bonds are. Um, and these are the, uh, the mutations along the top with the, the non-canonical amino acids in red here. Um, this is the, the loop that is responsible for binding to the target protein. Um, and if it is blue, it means that you have weakened the binding. And if it's red, it means you have enhanced it. So, you can see that mutations in this loop, particularly this lysine, which goes down into the um, basic amino acid recognition pocket of the um, trypsin, mutations of this are really catastrophic for binding, right? Um, 
and a lot of other mutations in this binding loop are also really bad. Uh, mutations in the cysteine residues, which prevent appropriate folding of the, the peptide, are also really catastrophically bad. Um, and most of the other positions are reasonably tolerant. Um, and you can start to see some sort of interesting things that you wouldn't be able to see looking at, say, uh, N-methylalanine and proline. You can see that they have very similar profiles, right? And N-methylalanine is an analog of proline. And most of the properties that you think of for proline that make it special are actually related to it being N substituted rather than it being a closed ring. So this is not so surprising. Um, so this was a, a nice sort of uh, proof of principle of what we were doing. Um, but we were still a only able to use three amino acids, three non-canonical amino acids at a time, right? So um, this is a, an example that might be a bit closer to the, uh, the hearts of some of the people in this audience. This is the interaction of uh, a helix from uh, Puma with MCL1. Right? And we started working on this because there was a postdoc in the lab who had come from um, Jane Clark's lab in Cambridge, and he had spent his entire PhD making variants of the protein and the peptide and getting very precise measurements of the, um, the binding affinity, looking at uh, delta delta G. Right? And what he was interested in trying to do was find a much faster way of getting those measurements. So this particular peptide, the, this bit of Puma, is actually uh, it's a remarkably homogeneous peptide in terms of its amino acid usage. All of these amino acids in red are not required in the natural sequence, and you could, in theory, replace these with non-canonical amino acids, but it would still only get you to about 20, maybe 24, if you put two in in place of the serine and one in place of the serine, right? So you'd still only be talking about 24 amino acids if you put in a whole bunch of uh, non-canonical ones. And not only that, you would lose the information about what happens with phenylalanine mutations and serine mutations. So you would be losing quite a lot of the interesting saturation mutagenesis. So, so, so Joe, the guy that really did a lot of this work, worked out a very clever way that you can scan essentially an infinite set of amino acids through saturation mutagenesis experiments. Um, this is a little bit technical, and again, there is a lot of technical detail that sort of goes unsaid here, but basically you use barcoded primers to encode genetic codes. So you can set up a reaction where you have a genetic code like this where just one amino acid has been changed, and you can set up another one where the same amino acid has been changed to something else, and another one where it's been changed to something else, right? So in, in this sort of example, um, we've got methylalanine, dialanine, amino acid, butyric acid, et cetera. And you translate the peptides like I showed you before for the cyclotide. So here, if you have a, a random codon, you get the um, methylalanine. Here, this one's methylalanine. This one, it's dialanine. This one is dialanine, and so on. Now, I, I told you right at the start that we uh, recover the library by RT-PCR, right? But in fact, we usually do the RT step before the selection because it stabilizes the RNA. So if you do your RT step with a barcoded primer, then you can use the barcode to tell you what is the underlying genetic code. So this barcode here tells you that where you see a methionine codon, it's methylalanine. And this barcode tells you that where you see a methionine codon, it's dialanine. And this barcode tells you amino acid, butyric acid, and so on. Okay. Then you mix the whole thing together, do the selection and sequence like I showed you before. And now in this case, we can start to look at much more diverse structures. Okay? So here is a set of 20 or more, 21 non-canonical amino acids that have been scanned through. And this is in addition to all of the 20 canonical ones. So we have a full set here of 41 amino acids. Um, and really, it is... Um, almost infinitely expandable if you're prepared to do a bit of work. We're doing some experiments now looking to push this out to maybe 80 amino acids. Um, and now you can start to see some, um, some much more fine-grained changes. So uh, it is probably the case that there are people in this audience who can tell you more about what this tells you about the interaction than I can, because I'm not an expert in this interaction in any way. Um, but there are some interesting points, right? So here are all of the N-methyl amino acids. And these are, again, these are like proline, right? Because these are helix breakers. 
So you mutate to those and you, you break the helix. Um, I believe that this alanine, um, the, the mutations that you see here, which are enhancing binding, are bringing it more into line with the sort of consensus uh, sequence for similar peptides that bind, right? Because there are a whole family of these things. Um, and this time, notice that I've got, I've got actual quantification data here, right? The way that this is possible is because Joe had spent an entire PhD measuring the delta delta G for many of these variants. So with a small number of actual measurements, you can then calibrate this back to a quantified measure. Yeah. Um, and just in case you don't believe me that this is real data and that this is just noise and making it up or whatever, here are a series of mutants that show you the effect you can actually have on the KD. So this is the wild type sequence. This is the wild type sequence here, right? This, we're looking at this yellow bit there, um, and it has a KD of about three nanomolar. You make a single substitution here. And this is not a very big substitution, right? This is uh, isoleucine to um, O-methylhomocerine, which is a methionine analog, and this is uh, more than tenfold reduction in binding. Um, this one here has got five different mutations. There's the four you can see here, so uh, one to tyrosine, one to uh, tert-butylalanine, one to cyclohexylalanine, and there's a benzo, uh, benzothiazole uh, analog that you don't see. It sort of fell outside the, the bit that it was convenient to put on. And this will give you quite a substantial increase in affinity. Right? So these maps that we are generating really seem to reflect the underlying interaction. And so, of course, ultimately, so that, that what I've just showed you is really nice as a way of looking at uh, sort of protein-protein and protein-peptide interactions. Um, ultimately, of course, what we want is to be able to use this sort of technique to do structure activity relationships for the, the small, smaller molecules we're finding, the cyclic peptides that we're trying to make into drugs. Um, so this is essentially the same scan against this CP2 peptide that I showed you before. As I said, this is the one we tend to use when we are first working things out because we know it so well. Um, and one of the sort of nice things about this is uh, we can compare it to some of the non-canonical mutations we made based off the crystal structure in the first place. Right? So this D-alanine, for example, is, is quite nice. We know that this glycine can only be substituted to D-alanine and still retain binding, and that's what we see coming off the scan. Um, and I'm not going to show it to you now, but we have uh, similar data for the peptides to what I just showed you for um, the Puma MCL1 interaction, where we can start substituting some of these in and seeing the, the, um, the KDs change by exactly the magnitude we would expect. So if you're careful with how you do this, you can get really very quantitative data. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for the moment. Um, the, uh, this is the sort of summary of this second part about how you can adapt these uh, screening uh, techniques into doing uh, quantitative SAR type studies. Um, and as I said, we're looking to extend these out into um, larger sets of amino acids. It's hard to know how many you really need. Um, and I think that for those sort of more hydrophobic cyclic peptides that I was talking about at the start, or well, not start, at the end of the first section, how about how you can get these into cells and so on. I think the way forward is sort of a combination of these two approaches. So we need to start from something that's fairly small and hydrophobic, maybe something that is even a slightly weaker binder than the ones we're getting at the moment. You know, 500 nanomole would be fine. And then use these SAR approaches to really tighten up the binding in a way that retains the hydrophobicity at small size. And so that's what we're looking to do next. Um, and it just leaves me to uh, thank this huge number of people that have been involved in the work across a large number of different institutions and, um, and the funding agencies as well. And all of you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Uh, Angus, uh, so I've got a question about potential biasing of sites on the protein that you target by using, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how you cut off what you use, but if you use KD, you were talking at the start about inhibiting PPIs, yep. uh, but a lot of your peptides 
went into a deep pocket, one inhibited an enzyme, like they all would have very high KDs. So I don't know how you cut it off. Do you use KD as a cutoff for looking at um, counts and how, because you might miss a... Um, no, we don't, um, but y you, you probably are biasing for KD in the selection process. So um, not all of those ones I showed you had, had small binding pockets. The IL-6 receptor certainly doesn't, um, and you're getting still equivalent sorts of um, KDs there. Um, what tends to happen at the end of the selection is you get a, a large number of sequences out, and then you just align them. And what you get is you get families of peptides that appear in there. And you can see there's usually one that's very highly enriched, and the other ones are probably a result of sort of PCR errors creeping in from the parental sequence. And you usually get about 10 per selection, roughly. And then we would take those 10, and then we would test them and start looking at KDs. But they are already selected for KD. That's what the selection process itself does, right? So, so I wonder if you miss... It's, pro it's probably true that we do. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think, I think that, you know, as I was saying, I think we need to get to smaller, slightly smaller compounds. Um, it may well be that when we do that, we get lower, rather higher KDs. Um, it, there are issues around the overall diversity of the library and the overall screening capacity of the system related to the length of the peptide. So as you decrease the length, at some point you start going below the screening capacity of the system and then your library is smaller and you have to expect that you're going to get weaker binding from a less diverse set. So, so the, Sorry, just to follow up on that, yeah. then I imagine that uh, a lot of the, it will, it will obviously depend on the protein that you're trying to target. If it has a lot of pockets, it's, you're going to it's bias to those pockets. It certainly does. Yeah. Um, but we, so, it, it, it depends on how you set it up in some ways. If we get less than about 50 nanomolar, we're usually pretty disappointed in that with the libraries we've been using at the moment. Um, and there, I mean, there are protein. There are proteins that for which this approach fails completely. But I don't think it's related to the presence or absence of pockets. I think it's related to the nature of the protein. Sometimes its function, and often the quality of the prep. Um, certainly, we have examples of things that um, bind to. Um, concave surfaces. We did some, we did a selection against the Zika virus protease recently, and you, you would assume working with that compound, I mean, it's, it's a protease, right? You would, it's got a protein binding pocket. You would assume that the peptides are going in there, but it turns out that all we got was allosteric inhibitors that bind to the backside of the protease, um, and we see both, yeah. I'm missing one of your slides on the first part that you looked at ESA. Um, yeah. And I was just wondering why you would do that uh, in terms of because what do you, do you look at PSA or LOCD because that would probably be better parameters for cell penetration rather than BSA, which in some way. Uh, oh, so, so so BSA on there was sorry that was um, that was a binding specificity. Oh, okay. That was bo bovine serum albumin. That's so it, it's just that it um, we were worried that with such hydrophobic compounds it was just non-specifically sticky. So, so we did some binding to some other things. And uh, okay. one of the first ones we did was bovine serum album because it tends to bind to sticky things and it seemed like a good control. Yeah. Okay. Well? Um, I was just curious, how are you maintaining your libraries? Are these just, are they just synthesized DNA that's incorporating all the mutations that you want? Or are you yeah, so cloning the, techniques? Or? Um, so the, we make the DNA by primary extension from oligos. We do that in one go, and we transcribe that into RNA in a bulk lot. So typically sort of a, a 10 mil transcription reaction. And then you purify that off a, a page gel. This is all, it's all molecular biology of yeah, like so 30, 30 years not, ago. You're not like making clones through bacteria or No, no. We, so, so what we used to do, um, and it, it's not, really the library synthesis. We used to do the sequencing by saying a sequencing, and then you'd have the clones of the final products in bacteria. 
but no, the, the initial stuff, it's all... You, you can't put it through bacteria because the... Um, well, yeah, limits your diversity, and that's why this sort of approach actually works a bit better than Farge displays, because you can... Your, your only limitation on diversity is concentration in Avogadro. You don't have a transformation step. Mm. This was next. Um, not sure it says that, but so you probably screen a lot of protein mm. right now. Mm. Uh, so you screen some classes of protein and with defined scaffolds. You mean the peptides have defined scaffolds or uh, the protein will have um, protein uh, automatically kind of yep. careful family I think yep. so with some sort of observation in the scaffold. So do you see in Maybe not now, but do you expect to see some redundancy? You know, you screen one type of kinase and you go to another one and you find some um, similar peptides. So you can actually build it's, full knowledge it's, around this particular scaffold? Um, I'm not sure. So, so I, I haven't talked about the sort of specificity at all here, but the specificity is usually very, very high. So that example with the human and the chicken protein, that is unusual because the peptides were binding to the orthologs from different species. And we usually have some trouble with that because you can't do mouse models or anything because the, um, the ones you select against the human won't hit the mouse one afterwards. So there is a very high degree of selectivity. Um, having said that, we've done some work with... Um, with metallo beta lactamases for antibiotic resistance. And in that case, we had three homologous proteins and the objective was to hit all of them, right? And the approach we took in that case was to um, run the selection in parallel against each of the three targets. And then you can kind of cross the streams later on, right? And mix it all together and then reselect and see what hits all of them. Um, and doing that, we were able to find some molecules that were active against all three, and also we could find some that were specific for each one. And there did seem to be sort of um, identifiable features about the peptides that came out that made it look like these ones are going to hit all three together. But it, I, think, I think it's hard to generalise, yeah. And John, and then on the back end. The, the thing that fascinates me is being able to solve your intracellular protein. Mm. With all this screening technology and bearing in mind that you have a scaffold, I wonder, have you thought about trying to identify a better scaffold that has better yes. uh, um, membrane permeability and then kind of lock? I know you like the variability mm. of the million positions, but locking in some of that yep. variability. Yep, um, we, we have. Um, part of the problem is that the... Um, the, the the compounds that are known to be able to do that are slightly different chemically to the ones we are able to display screen. Okay, so cyclosporin, for example, is head to tail cyclized, and that's impossible. I was even thinking of your your space uh, cyclopeptide and actually screening for things that go through membrane better. Yes, so we have. And we, then we, you would find we, positions. We, that we, might we, be more we've also thought of doing that. Um, at the moment, we just don't. I mean, so. So using the technique we have, you can't screen for um, things that go through membranes because... You lose the detection. Yeah, because... The, so, so it, you could, could you not like link it to some sort of fluorophore and then just take a component and on, a, on a plate reader or something? Um, so you, you could try that, but... The, um, so, yeah, so we, so we, so we, we have tried a bunch of things, and they've always failed. <laughs> um, so, so the, you don't quite get a sense for the, um, the, the molecule when I show them as those cartoons, right? But the RNA is nearly everything. It's a huge RNA with a little peptide hanging off the end. So anything physicochemical is going to be mostly about the RNA. We've done a little bit of work with um, membrane-coated magnetic beads in the idea that you might just be able to get something that goes into the membrane. Um, and that has been somewhat promising. Um, but so far what we've got is sort of cell-penetrating peptides, so arginine-rich um, peptides, and they are cell-penetrating. We can make them by solid phase. And but 
they're not these sorts of cyclospore or anything hydrophobic things. Um, we really need to go back and do those experiments again with a library where you've got a much more hydrophobic set of amino acids and see what comes out, see if we get things that are passively permeable. The other thing we've thought about is just making them by solid phase in, with our linkage chemistry at smaller sizes and running pamper assays and these sorts of things, but we just we don't have good examples at the moment, so we need to find them. Along those lines, I was kind of intrigued by the <coughs> your hydrophobic peptide libraries. I mean, how mm. are you balancing solubility? Yeah, so... Yeah, how many are you losing? I, well, so we don't lose any in the selection because... No, before the selection and the production. No, 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 because it's, it's okay because they're linked to the RNA and the RNA makes them soluble. But... <laughs> but, 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 but when we come to make them by solid phase, yeah. then they are very difficult to work with. So, I mean, that hydrophobic one that I showed you, I showed you two peptides that we were able to measure KDs for, but there were others that we were not. Yeah. Um, that's right. I was going to ask a similar question, sort of you know, you're balancing the, mm -hmm. your scaffold for your specificity, but then adding a component for the soft penetration, but then you're getting bigger, I guess, in a way as you want. Yeah. And I mean, so we've done a little bit of work with cell penetrating peptides, and it hasn't really worked very well for us. Um, our experience with, with cell penetrating tags is that, is that you need, you seem to need to get about a critical threshold somewhere. You seem to need to be at 500 nanomolar or one micromolar before you get good cell penetration. And I mean, that's okay, but it, most of our molecules in vitro are active at, you know, 10 or 50. And it's just a bit disappointing when you have to lose, you know, 10, 20 fold of activity yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's the same problem for everybody, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's definitely, it, you know, I, mean, I don't need to tell you it's in the field. Right? Um, I think, and we have a slightly different problem to a lot of people because um, most people working in this area have a specific molecule that they're interested in and they want to know how can I modify that to make it go through membranes. Whereas what we want to know is we want to know what is the general properties of the library that will bias it for that. And so there isn't much literature around about which amino acids are best for that, you know? How does phenylalanine compare to, compare to isoleucine and these things? So there's work to be done. I think, and, and again, I'm sure you know this, but I think the, the last two years have seen a real explosion in people applying sort of traditional medicinal chemistry type, um, I mean, modelling's not the right word, but sort of looking at um, Lipinski type rules for macrocyclic peptides, um, which personally I thought was a waste of time because they've got so many internal hydrogen bonds that it's gonna totally stuff your calculations, but it seems like it sort of holds, actually. Um, and so I think we've got a, a much better idea now of what's required. And the really critical thing seems to be hydrogen bond donors. We've just got to get rid of them as much as possible. So. All right, it's three o'clock. Um, so we should probably wrap it up there. So thanks, Toby, for a great talk. Thank uh, you. Toby is around if people want to speak to him a little bit, but he's got a pretty full schedule, so you'll have to be important. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Toby. <laughs>